Hey, did we uh, see the story out of Rhode Island? This is a crazy story this morning. City <laughs> official in Rhode Island, you you saw the story? No, I didn't. No, had no. resigned, just resigned after she got caught making a male employee dress up as a woman for a press conference. Her name is Sue Stenhouse, and she was one of the, she was the executive director of the Senior Enrichment Center in Cranston. Uh, she wanted some senior citizens from the community to stand with her for a press conference where she announced a new program to provide snow shoveling for the elderly. But she couldn't find any real senior citizens, so she put one of her bus drivers in drag and had him stand behind her. <laughs> what? This is the craziest story. It oh is. She didn't seem too sorry about it either. A couple days later, a local reporter went to her house, and she swore at him and denied the whole thing. All right. But so was it a lie or wasn't it? Well, the what which part the, the that they reached out to her? Well, no, she's saying I, she seems like she's saying the story is fired. Bogus. Uh, she's been fired, so they're saying it's it's true. I don't understand and why the bus driver's saying it's true. I don't understand why the person had to dress up in drag. Why couldn't you just put someone behind me and go? Uh, this is the bus driver and X, Y, and Z. I don't understand. I don't get it either. So, I don't get it. <laughs> um, you know, some people have these ideas; they just don't seem to turn out all that right. And the uh, NFL over the weekend, of course, Aaron Rodgers. This was a Hail Mary game, right? He did it again. I cannot believe that he did it again. I Andrew, mean, obviously, you, they didn't okay? win the game. But. Are you okay? I, You know, I am actually doing really well. It was that night I wasn't because, uh, you know, I Andrew had my fair share of Utica clubs. a fan. <laughs> it's so bad that it's like someone cut his leg off or something. Well, the, the hardest part was I was at the Comets game, and from where I was sitting – I could see the and I had a game recorded at my in my home, mm-hmm. so I I could go home and watch it after the game. But then I had seen from where I was sitting, one of the bars that had the, the TV on. Oh, and out in the in the concourse they had TVs on. I said, yeah. I, after the second period, I said, Dallas, we, we got to go, we got to leave. Left. I got to go home yeah. and watch it. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it was a very stressful game, high blood pressure. Uh, lost it. A little bit when they lost, so, but I was good the next day. So Rodgers throws a Hail Mary pass, and uh, and it takes him into overtime. Do I have yeah, that right? Correct. And and then it was yet another Hail Mary pass going the other way that uh, that. Well, it was it took was, him down inside the five yard line. It was only an eight or a ten yard pass, but nobody for some reason wanted to cover Larry Fitzgerald, so he Who ran. Had been dominating se- the whole game. Yeah, he yeah. ran like seventy five yards. With the ball, nobody and then it could wasn't just him. that though. It wasn't just that. So this Green Bay Packers defense has really played well for the most part all year long. Then, one of the biggest things that was their kind of one of their biggest weapons was being able to stop teams in the red zone, even on like goal line stands. So Larry Fitzgerald has the seventy-five yard run down to the 10, 15, and then they just let him walk right in on a shovel pass. Yeah, and it's the frustrating part for for Aaron Rodgers is. He is probably one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the position, and he'll go down in history as the best, uh, one of the best to ever play. And when you don't give him a chance to touch the ball in overtime to go on to the NFC Championship game, it's just unacceptable. Well, the Cardinals started off at their own 20. Larry Fitzgerald took it 75 yards on play number one to give the Cardinals first and goal. And here... A little flip to Fitzgerald, he scores! And the Cardinals win an amazing game. So that huge Hail Mary was for naught. Got him into overtime, but that's about it. Barb, Wait, and, yeah, Andrew, and one is more there thing. any more? Oh, there's one more thing. There's one more thing from Andrew, Barb, that we're going to get to you. He's interrupted the I've, sports you know, guy, uh, yeah. the host of the show. This is I've, I've gradually become more and more mature when it comes to, to watching sports, but it seems like, and I'll just say this, <laughs> Look it at Barb. seems like with, with Green Bay... <laughs> Poor Barb. I'm sorry, Barb. Self-assessment, I oftentimes, oftentimes to me, seems kind of like it's more of, of hopeful reassurance that this yeah. is, just that this behavior has, and and somewhat potentially delusional. It's just, it's I, I try and be more mature, but it's just I'm sick and tired of losing games in frustrating circumstances. Yeah. We, you know, last year in the NFC Championship game against Seattle, we had the game one. We totally blew it. Yeah. I mean, he's come a long way. He almost quit the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Based on the text messages we sent last year, oh he God, almost quit that. the show. Yeah. And then, uh, to you know, the coin flip incident, and, you know, it didn't flip. The coin literally didn't flip, and then the ref picked it right back up and didn't give Rodgers the chance to – 
It's just I'm sick okay. and tired of you're losing. Gonna, you're going to have to let this go. <sighs> uh, Barb Mickler's in the studio right now. Barb Mike, Do I say your name right? I don't know why I'm having this moment here. It's Mikeler, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Barb. I should know That's that. That's all right. And, Six and one, half dozen yeah. of the other. Well, so, like, the other night somebody called me Bob. Oh. <laughs> Did you answer? Where, where, where <laughs> was it? Somebody, somewhere else I was, uh, I was with somebody else, and they had, oh, it was, it was a... It was somebody who was older, but they had said, oh, I remember Bill. Absolutely. And then I was leaving the room about three minutes later. And he said, see you later, Neil. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> see you later. Mm. Uh, good morning, Barb. Good morning. Uh, Barb is from the Westside Senior Center. And what do you guys have uh, going on here this morning? You have a big, uh, this uh, coming. there's the thrift store part and there's the flea market part. Yes. So let's talk about it. Coming this Friday and Saturday, January 22nd, 23rd. From 9 to 2, we are having a gigantic flea market and thrift store sale. We have tons and tons and tons of all different kinds of items, antiques, collectibles, old records, tapes, you name it, we wow. have it. And we have tons of clothes. And so what we're going to do uh, with the thrift store is we have very large, big uh, shopping bags. People can fill up the bags for $5. Anything you can get in the bag, $5. Well, this is a uh, midwinter clearance going on yes, right now. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Niagara Mohawk wants their money. You know, other Got companies it. want Great. their money. You're fine. And we have, to, to, we have to be very, it. very creative. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, we've come up with this. And like I said, there, there are tons of items. Anything you can think of, we have. Got it. I thought this was settled. You guys had worked your butts off to get that Nymo built. Starts build. again. It starts again, huh? Starts again. Well, you couldn't possibly be in the same size hole you were in before. Well, especially no, if we've had such a mild, we've had such a mild uh, right. winter yeah. so far. But we have a few thousand dollars. They, they, right. they. It, it's the delivery charges, you know, that they, yeah, they keep raising and raising and raising. And um, we are open two days a week. Okay. Um, and uh, but your big moment is this Friday. This where you Friday, really yes. Rake yes. in the dough. This Friday, this Saturday, nine to two. Uh, we right. want the community to come down and see what we're all about. We want them to help support us because that's the only support we will be getting. All right. So what we ought to do on Friday morning mm -hmm. is do we'll, we'll uh, maybe get a, a preview in the 8 o'clock hour. Okay. And you can go through. We could talk to you from over there. And okay. you could walk through and tell us some of the items. Oh, great. Right. Like so I'm looking at a item here it's a blah 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 i'll tell you one of my favorite pieces we have an antique punch bowl set it is gorgeous mm. very could very... they put that in a five dollar bag no no okay uh, no it's too big it wouldn't fit <laughs> Got it. In. no so no, how much is uh, so how much is that going to sell for well i don't know we're uh two thousand dollars no 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 we're, we're negotiating on prices there but uh, all right we do have so a you lot do of have some neat items oh yes we do very unusual so yeah. a lot of unusual items a lot of times you know people clean out their estates and that yeah and yeah. they give us things and you'd be surprised what color is the punch bowl uh it's a beautiful uh pressed glass and it's lined in like a gold filigree mm, on the top right. and it comes uh with an extension that it can go either on the table or on a pedestal okay beautiful so it's a beauty it's gorgeous. Hey, is that it could yours? be yours on Friday. No, it's not you mine. seem to have an attachment to it. I, I, I can appreciate the finer okay. things. Of, yeah. yeah. If okay. it's gone at 9, 9 a.m. on Friday, you know that Barb bought it. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey. Only if it's left over. Only no, I, left I, over. We're, ho we're hoping a right. lot of the items nine, will go. 9 till 2 on Friday. 9 to 2 on Friday. 9, nine to 2, two on, on Saturday. Saturday. Okay, yes. Barb. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Barb Meichler is the director of the Westside Senior Center in Utica and making their money to keep things rolling. Yes, we are. All right. Nice job. Good Thank luck, you. How are the roads out there coming? Terrible. Up? It's nasty. Oh, there's uh, 49 here slipping and sliding. Yeah, it's all very over. slick. Yeah, very so slick people have to be very, very careful. Yeah. Very uh, careful. When I was driving in this morning, we were all doing a, a group of like 50 cars doing 20 miles an hour all the way from the valley to Utica. And the minute the plow, because there was two plows covering that 5S lane to two lanes. So one in one lane, one in the other, so nobody could pass. But the minute that plow went off, I don't know, after Dyke Road, I don't know. These everybody stepped on it. People were doing like eighty. I don't mm. know how. And it was. And and that's the part that wasn't uh, sanded or, or salted or plowed. Oh, Andrew, I get the feeling that you know the DPW or the the New York State um, whoever does the roads on five vesters is literally like, okay, Bill Keeler has left his, left house. his house. Let's get let's the plows get, out. Get out there. Here we go. <laughs> and he's on the accident. Yep. Get ahead. Pull Thank him you. in. Pull him in. All right, that might be it. Barb, thank you, and be Thanks careful so. out there. Here's Christine with an update. Six forty nine. <laughs> 
710, a little slick out there. Lieutenant Steve Hawkins in studio now. How slick is it out there this morning? Uh, not terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I three, four inches maybe out there. It's, it's not yeah. too bad. It's cold. Uh, but the roads, uh, if you get roads that are not, that are completely covered, there's going to be, you know, don't drive 80 miles an hour. No, yeah, definitely got to drive slow. Probably I, shouldn't drive 80 anyway, though, should you? No. Yeah, I know that. Okay. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, th- th- we've been talking a lot now. This would, might be a bit of a spoiler. And, Andrew, are you going to be okay for this? I, are you going to uh, lose your cool? Not as bad as uh, Saturday night, but I may. I can't, okay. I can't make any promises. The program is on Netflix, and it's called Making a Murderer. And we had thrown this at Lieutenant Steve Hauck last week. It would have been nice to have law enforcement, the opinion of law enforcement. And uh, through some binge watching, um, as much as you can actually handle, you have completed the entire series, right? I did. Ten episodes. And did you watch the Nancy Grace uh, piece? Uh, no. I can't oh stand God. to watch her. You mean, you mean her summary of the, I'm telling you, I mean, the, the evidence was in his car. What do you think, Donnie Wahlberg of CBS Blue Bloods? What do you think? Okay. And then we, <laughs> luckily, we have Nancy Grace here right now, um, who's actually... Uh, who's also a Packers fan. At, at is, times, morphing is, into is a... Is equally uh, irritating. Is yeah. equally irritating. As equally... <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. So, first off, um, th- were you shocked by the prosecutor? Uh, I... At the end, yeah, I, I guess I end. didn't. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. Oh either. come yeah. on, he was a scuzzball from oh, you moment thought, one. Come on, I but made did a you comment. see that coming? Uh, I no, mean, not that there was a creep specifically. factor. Specifically, there was a creep factor. There was a creep factor. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. There was. But I never I am in a million expert on creeps. I, I, listen, there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of creep factors out there, but to see someone get caught is is usually not the case. But his bravado, he was laughing at every press conference yeah. and smiling. What do you think of that? His, those, you know, you've, you've talked um, oftentimes, we speak with you about how the media has uh, been dealt with by municipalities, especially in the government, uh, depending on situations that have happened. And uh, this, they really, they really put evidence out there that wasn't even real evidence. They just threw it out there whenever they had it. I was surprised all the information that was given up uh, to the media in those press conferences. I was too. And, and again, you have to, I backtrack because of when this happened, this isn't, you know, this isn't a recent thing. So right. uh, a couple of things, uh, when you talk about the smiling and laughing, I was, I felt that way about the prosecutor. I really felt that way about his uh, initial defense attorney oh, for, the, for the 16 year old. Oh, uh, I that. saw him come in and I'm like, he, his client is, could it could possibly be convicted of yeah. first degree murder, and he's got a yeah. grin on his face. I, I just I couldn't. It was like he was happy to be there, and, was, he, and he was right. already he was already declaring guilt for his client. I mean, you, right. you don't hear that out of a defense attorney. Well, and not saying, even so much, not even so much that. But you're not going to get a chance to talk. Yes, Andrew, go ahead. Going as far as to have his investigator that's working for him kind of coerce a confession out of the kid, right? And not only that, I, I could be wrong about this. I don't think I am. Before he even met with the kid, held a press conference to introduce himself and yeah. he was, and, and go on to say things like, you know, this is going to be one of the most difficult challenges I've ever faced, and I've faced many challenges in my career. Hasn't even met with the kid to hear his not story. Him, and yeah. and he goes as far as to, you know, talk about Stephen Avery being guilty and saying, oh, this was just motivated by an act of right. pure he, evil he or whatever. Throws yeah. guilt on, uh, he throws guilt on Avery. Sure. Um, definitely crazy. Right. I think if you look at, I think uh, uh, certainly not an attorney, and certainly yep. uh, I, I'm I'm not on the defense side on on many cases. Obviously, yep. Yep. where my opinions, but I think if you I think if you're a defense attorney and you have a client that is innocent, I think you lean towards. Um, all of the case. You look at you look at the facts of the case. You look at the person. I think if you have a client that perhaps has maybe admitted guilt to you, I think now you're going to try to pick apart procedure and you're going to try to the the technical issue of the case as opposed to right. uh, the person themselves. Uh, I think that this attorney just before he even went in agreed my client did it and, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. So and, he and, took whatever and, evidence and was out there. Almost almost as if he was looking for high fives or. Maybe somebody to buy him a cocktail at the happy hour after the day was over to be able to say, you're not going to believe it. We got a full confession. We got a full confession out of this kid. And it's and he and he hires a a an investigator to go in and get that confession. We're not talking about Steve Avery here. 
Um, this is the uh, making of a murder. It's all about him. It's his his younger nephew that the that really. I, I, let me ask you this. So beyond the Stephen Avery part, would you agree it is despicable that this young kid has not been given a new trial? Uh, based on the based on that forced confession. Here, here's the one thing about the series itself is after the series, after I, I did some research into it, yeah. and there are aspects of the case that mm-hmm. are really, to me, vital in opinion as to whether he did or not, because none of us sat on the jury. So unless you're right. in the courtroom and listen to all the testimony, you really, you really just, it's an opinion more than However, anything. However, though, uh, all it takes is one stupid move by a prosecutor or by an defense attorney that could, on a technicality, force a mistrial um, and, uh, for instance, talk about the, the, the confession. Right. Uh, talk about the way they interrogated that kid. Would you find that when you go into an interrogation, wouldn't you, as a police officer, aren't you in a position to say, listen, we, we want to get the confession. We believe this person did it. We want to get the confession, but we're going to make sure we follow certain procedures so that this doesn't get thrown out of court, right? Well, not even so much on a, a technical issue. It's more of a, a it's a human issue. You want the truth. You're, right. You're not looking for a confession. You're not looking for someone to tell you they did it. What you're looking for is the truth and the facts behind it. Do you think that they, uh, the, the, that they were looking for the truth? Uh, I think that's probably how they started. Yeah. I think they got very frustrated because of his inability to communicate. And I don't and think that's it's necessarily an intellectual issue, there. right? I don't think he was uh, he wasn't some uh, mastermind that right. that was withholding the police's uh, <laughs> it, it, you know it technique. Be the extreme opposite, right? I, I yeah. and I'm not saying that he wasn't that he didn't even do it. I'm right. saying that I don't think he had the mental capability to not necessarily understand right from wrong, right, right, or assist in his defense. That which you know the the thing you have to understand uh, you know when you're legally in in the courtroom as far as uh, mental capacity is. I just don't think he communicated. Uh, I right, think it showed right. by his history. Uh, I mean, he, he obviously is not at full capacity mentally. So back to his uh, interrogation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think that would have that would have lasted in a in a New York state court. I don't like the fact that they gave as a as a police officer and investigator. I don't like the fact that they gave him facts of the case. Yeah. Because yeah. that's that's you know that's the reason why in many cases you know we'll talk about it and you know publicly and there are things that just are left out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, you're not going to see them until they go to a trial because it, a lot of facts are only known to the killer or killers. So if you're putting the information out there, and if you remember, and I've said this to you many times, the John Benet Ramsey case, mm-hmm. a lot of people forget that a guy confessed to that and was arrested and was convicted and found out he had nothing to do with it. Right. He had taken all of the facts that were putting out in the case. And he and wanted to be. Uh, he he wa- wanted right. To he be was looking for the fame or whatever the case right. may be. And he had all the facts of the case. Don't they- you want to, when you're, when you're in a prosecution, uh, when you're prosecuting, don't you want to be able to say, there's no way he would have known this. This yep. evidence hadn't been released. It wasn't in a press conference, which is another reason why they shouldn't be putting stuff out in a press conference. The uh, the only person that could have known this information is the killer, but he, they never had the ability to really be able to say that because so much information had been put out there. And if you look at the video of the interrogation, you realize they gave him that information. There's a fine line because you can't just walk into an interrogation and say, now tell me what you know, because right. you're going to get nothing. Right. So you do have to talk about the case with the, the suspect. Sure. So but it's that a was fine going line. Too far. I think they crossed the line. Yeah. I okay. think they went too far into it, and, and, that, and that gets into which I think is probably going to be your next thing is whether the police framed him or not. Well, I want to get into that, and, um, and I want to tell you right off the bat that my belief is I'm not, I'm not willing to say – this whole thing about pardoning um, uh, Stephen Avery, uh, I, I don't think I don't agree with. I'm not. I am not someone who is saying that they're innocent. Either one of them. However, I also think that there were mis things that were done inappropriately. That they both deserve a trial out of that area. I think both of them deserve a trial away from that area. It was too much information got out. People had already made up their minds. Do you disagree with that? No, I think people probably had made up friends. And yeah. Plus, and I'm not saying guilt or innocence right. here. I'm saying I'd love to see it 
in a fair court, I don't believe they were given a, a fair shot at in the legal system. I think it's difficult when you have a case that's as horrific as a case as that is. Yeah. I think it's very difficult for any jury to sit in that jury and not want to make somebody responsible for what happened to that woman. I think it's very difficult. Right, I think you feel right. compelled as a human being mm-hmm. to right a wrong. So I think you you may be, in some situations, kind of lean towards, hey, we've got the police yeah. are saying somebody did this. We've got to hold them responsible. Sure. That's up to the prosecutor. It's up to the defense. It's up to the judge. It's up to everybody there in the courtroom to level the playing field and say, listen, here's how this legal yeah, system yeah. works, regardless of what you thought coming in. Because you can't live in a community that small and not know something about it. Sure. It's just impossible. All right, I'm going to break. We're going to come back. And uh, we're... We're about to ask a uh, a police a member of the police force if it's possible that these two, or at the very least, Stephen Avery, was framed. Uh, we'll come back with that one coming up in a second. Hold tight. Coming right back. 720 at WIBX. All right. The program is on Netflix, if you haven't seen it as of yet. It's kind of died down just a little bit, but, man, there's a, there is a lot to talk about with this making of a murderer. Stephen Avery and his younger, very young uh, nephew or whatever, um, both of them in, uh, in jail, don't seem, based on, on what we've seen on the uh, documentary, which is, a, uh, do you find this is the most amazing documentary you've ever seen? Because it's taken more like a Dateline series, and everything is real, and everything was, was taped. It seemed like they had so much to work with. Every interrogation, every interview, all that stuff was taped. It, it, it seems to me that this is an unprecedented series that may open the door for others like this. It was pretty, in, pretty intense, wasn't it? Uh, it was intense. I, I will say, though, I, I don't really think it's a documentary. I think it's more I of an agree. editorial. Well, I, I think that they have an opinion. It could be, yeah. And Although they, they say they left things out on both sides. Okay. And, and, and to be honest... Um, we wouldn't really know, right? I mean, unless we were there in the courtroom. But they they have said, and I saw this on the Today Show, that um, they they as much as they left out that would have benefited the defense, they left stuff out that would have benefited the uh, would have would have worked against the defense. So you know, whether that's true or not, we don't know. And you may be right. This was done. This is an entertainment uh, program, sure. uh, but it it featured an awful lot of re- it was all real footage, which. That's the part that I find to be it's a dateline piece and and it was um, and it was portrayed as a 10 episode series unprecedented uh, and I have a feeling we're going to be seeing more of stuff like this. So with that said, um, it's maybe the documentary or the series wants you to believe that there was a setup. Certainly Stephen Avery wants you to believe that he was set up by police that they actually, planted the blood um it was odd that it took them so long to find the keys to the car and there they were right out in the in in the open every time a piece of evidence was discovered one of those two sheriff's deputies were there who clearly hated this guy there's a lot to make you believe that it is possible that these police officers these deputies could have planted the evidence i ask you is that is that possible well, I think you have to go back. If, if you're going to say that, I think you have to go back and you have to say, uh, did they have motive to do something like that? So, uh, you know, you look at they were they were suing him. He, he was suing mm-hmm. these. Uh, Seems there was motive. Right. Well, yeah. yes and no. Uh, anybody mm-hmm. that's done this job for any length of time has been sued, been sued probably many times. It's right. the nature of what we do. So to say that a police officer would go out and frame somebody for murder because they were suing him. I think is a bit of a stretch. But if you but but let's say you come upon the murder mm-hmm. and you know he did it. Okay, see that's where that's that's where I I diverge because I there's a big difference between incompetence right and going out and framing someone. Mm-hmm. So and I think that's what the documentary and I think the defense tried to portray was that because this wasn't incompetence, this was all intentional along the right, way. Right, right. So that I just can't, I, I just can't grasp my head around. There that. is a lot of, I mean, in in defense of the police department, there, there's an awful lot that had to fall in place perfectly, an awful lot that had to happen without anyone seeing it, for this whole thing to come true that 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 they were framed, right? Well, I think that's not uncommon. You know, the, 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 that's the weird thing about this is right. uh, cases in life is not filmed. 
like right, this right. was along the way. So they give you the impression that since it kind of wasn't filmed, that it must have been done shady. And it's, I think it's just the way your mind goes. It's right, like, well, right. everything else is on camera. Why isn't this? Well, because they were doing an investigation. That's right. why. But I think you look at a couple of key parts of it, the blood. I think you look at the key. Uh, I, I agree with you in the respect that if they agreed initially on that this sheriff's department would not take part in the investigation, then don't take part in the investigation. Right. And don't that say alone, one thing and then do something and else. And that's where I go back to I'm not sure on innocence or guilt. But there's enough done, enough conflict of interest, enough impropriety, enough uh, interviewing without uh, uh, interviewing the, the kid without his attorney near without all, all of these things together. There had to be something in there to say, you know what, let's get a fair trial out of the way. So there's absolutely no question. And and that and, and then, you know, we assume that this Stephen Avery is uh, is the mastermind of all of this. Or is he the dummy? Why would you, why would you place the vehicle on your own lot and cover it up with a couple of branches? Why would you have the the bones and burn the body right in front of your own trailer? Why would you leave the keys right in your trailer when you know they're they're going to be fingering you on this whole thing? There is so much that it, you that is a as someone with common sense would look at and say, I would never do that. Not that I you know, would be in the middle of a, of a murder. But if you were, why would you do such stupid things? Or is this guy just so stupid that he, you know, the guy's so dumb, he left all the evidence right there for police to find. But if he's so dumb, would all that evidence still be in the bedroom? Like, you know, there was... And there was no evidence in the bedroom. The, the blood splatter for the kid, let's talk about the kid, there was no blood splatter in the bedroom. None of that evidence existed in the bedroom. And they said, well, he cleaned it all up. That's That was the excuse there. He was able to... now. If you shoot someone the way they described that she was shot in that bedroom, would you be able to clean up all the DNA evidence? Well, they said she was shot in the garage. They said her throat okay, was slit right. in the bedroom. But yeah. there still would be blood. Uh, yeah, most most of the time there would be. There There is a way, certainly. There would be DNA evidence. But I think so. there were several days that went on. Um, and, and I think like one of the things they talked about was the fact that there was blood in the back of her, tr- of her truck, which right, says right. that the body was brought there. Right. Where I think... My guess is what probably, if he did it, what probably happened was after she was killed, they put her in the back of her truck like, okay, let's take her somewhere. And like, wait a minute, how are we going to do that? Right. Let's keep her here. we got this huge compound. We'll figure something out. Right. And they take her out. So now her blood's in there. They take her out. They've got this car. They, they say, okay, we'll get rid of her. But, you know, like they said, well, I had this crusher. Why not crush it? Well, it's not like it disintegrates when you crush it. It just sure. compacts yeah. it down. That yeah. makes it even more evidence that, hey, you did this to her because right, somebody's right. running your compact or who runs yeah. the compact or that sort of sure. thing. So I think it was maybe put back there and covered it and said, eh, nobody will find it. You know, uh, it's what a about, huge compound. What about the uh, chances that it was the uh, another relative that did this and is trying to pin it on Stephen Avery? Well, that's very possible. Uh, yeah. You know, again, because they don't have, you know, they don't, it's not like they have, because her body was burned, they don't have fingernail yeah. scrapings or anything from him specifically. That's very possible. Mm-hmm. But again, you have to look at who would have done it. I think there was only a couple of yeah. younger guys in the family, like his brother. And, you and weren't uh, you weren't at all suspicious of the fact that the 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 blood evidence had been the box had been opened, a uh, sealed box had been opened, and that there was actual a, a from a, a needle. There was a needle hole that was inside the vial of blood. That didn't concern you at all. Uh you know, I'm not a serologist, so I don't right. do that stuff. So I can't tell you if if there would be some other reason to do that. I can yeah. tell you that when they tested the blood and they found that it had no preservatives in it, I, I think you well, have to. Well, I think that that, you know, that technology um, that was kind of a tainted. Uh, at least the defense is saying that is completely tainted. That test was completely tainted, and it, and it was it was allowed in court. That's where there seems to be maybe there could be we'd have new science that would would change that down the road. Well, I think it's the defense's job to say it's tainted. It would <laughs> they be. say that right. in everything. Sure. I mean, that's what yeah. you're supposed to do. So. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, you believe they did it based on what you saw? Uh, I do believe. I think Both of them? Beca- well, well, that's one thing. Is it, and That's kind of the thing. It's a package it's, deal, it's a package really. Deal. It's, it's a package yeah. deal. It's like yeah. if you agree one yeah. did it, the other one had to. Right, so, right. Uh, and I'm not saying the law says that way. I yeah. think, it, you know, just you know, we go that way uh, in your mind. I, but, I agree with you. I think that's a good point. And the other thing, the one big thing that, that I looked at was the fact that they found... Um, a DNA match under the hood of her car from him. 
Right. How does that get there? Yeah, that's what I, uh, the part of it was an awful lot had to be done and that's, as part of a setup. An awful lot had to be done. And that's my thing is having been involved in so many homicide yeah. cases, you know, with along the way, is there are so many hands in it. And you've got to get everybody to agree yeah. that we're going to do this to frame an individual. I just, right. I don't, it's so complex. Yeah. I just don't see it. And not the, not the attorneys. I'm talking about just the police officers mm-hmm. because the attorneys are just going by what evidence sure. they're presented. Yeah. So, uh, but the I just I see it almost impossible to see how you could take. I'm not saying like one person couldn't do it, but to take all these people that are involved in it and searching the yard and searching the car and then searching the house and I just don't see how you could get all that together. I just if if I can just jump in for a second, I have two questions. One of them is about the search where it was like they they basically took over the property. I understand it was a huge property. But for like almost two weeks, I think it was like nine, ten, yeah, eleven. Yeah, I want to get into that just a little bit, and then we'll wrap this. Uh, we'll wrap this thing up. But stand by, we'll come back, and I'll take a quick break. Birthdays today, January eighteenth. It is Martin Luther King Day. Caden Ford in Newport, happy birthday, and Patricia Mementi in Utica celebrating as well. Happy birthday! Uh, the cake comes from the Florentine Pastry Shop. You get a birthday on air by going to our news site at wybx nine fifty dot com or send in a postcard. Wybx birthdays ninety four eighteen River Road, Marcy one three four zero three. Christine with news coming up next on wybx. You know, one of the things about this uh, this case, this making a murderer, is that these are the scum of the earth, these people. And they're not pretty people, and uh, they don't speak well. Um, those people don't get the same fair shot when it comes to a jury. Forget police or any of that stuff. If you're an ugly person, I always said this, if you're ugly and uh, maybe you're abrasive, um, you will not most likely do well in a court of law. I think that's a little harsh, though, to say that they're the scum of the earth. Some would say that they're the salt of the earth. No, it, it, what I'm saying is, according to this community, mm-hmm. this this family's the scum of the earth. Right. I think that's a fair statement, right? Yeah, I, and people I'm have to remember, this is a very are. small It's a I'm very not small saying community. they are. Right. We're talking about a small saying. community. It's the perception. The perception, uh, not even the perception, it's what the people there seem to think about this family, that they're scumbags. I think they had good intent with trying to get a fair investigation by in, in bringing us, you know, a fair trial. They brought in a special prosecutor. They right. had, uh, you know, the sheriff's office. The problem is, we went back to it. Is why they, the, why were those two sheriff's deputies? They didn't take over the investigation. Right. right. It's the, maybe maybe they tried to give the you know the impression that yep. they did, but they didn't. What they probably should have done is probably moved it to like Green Bay and. Uh, you know, totally away from the area, a few hours away. No, you know. uh, it removed those sheriff's deputies from the scene. Right, um, absolutely. And they didn't. And isn't that enough to say there's a reasonable doubt? Well, it seems, it does seem in one respect that it's hard to do this job and and not have some emotional connection throughout right. your career. There yeah. are certain cases that that do that. You know, when it comes to kids or it comes to a crime that's so horrific, you can't help but get emotionally involved in yeah. it. It's the nature of, of what it is that we do. You can't be a human being if you're not. So it does seem that they did have some sort of emotional sort of well, let's talk about connection with that. Well, let's talk about that. And Christine's calling me out for calling them scum of the earth. Saying... Well, no, let me let me tell you. Um, based on the based on what you saw in the documentary uh, in episode 10, I believe it was, when they, the new defense attorney had come in for the kid and they were, they were uh, questioning on the stand the defense attorney of this kid and the investigator. It, it, didn't they say this is a one-branch family tree and we need to chop this down? Right, they did say that. They thought these people were the scum of the earth. And that's where the emotion came in, I really believe. Um, and, and it leaves, to me, as a juror, it leaves enough doubt in, it would leave enough doubt in my mind to say, boy, if there's a reasonable doubt, you can't find them guilty. That's the way our system's supposed to work. And by the way, there were a couple of jurors that came out and spoke to the Today Show and said they had definite reasonable doubt, but feared for their safety. So they, they, they voted guilty. I mean, that's to me, there's a mistrial in itself if they could prove that. Manaski had questions. So it gets back to the search. Uh, one part of this question is the key, but if police take over, whether it be a property, or and I know this was a huge property, are there guidelines on how long that you can take over a property when you have a search warrant? No. 
what would happen is is you're going in looking for specific evidence. So uh, I'll try to explain it this way. Let's say, for instance, I'm um, let's say, for instance, we execute a search warrant on a house, and we're looking for. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Years ago, I don't know if you guys remember, the sign for Fountain Elms was stolen. Do you remember uh, that? I don't remember that. Okay. Yeah. On Genesee Streets. Okay. They took it down. Anyway, it was stolen. Anyway, so that was my case. We we found out who had it. We executed a search warrant of the house for the sign. We found the sign. The sign is six, seven feet long, three feet wide. Uh, once we had the sign, yeah. we left. Right. I'm not opening drawers. I can't hide signs in drawers. Right, right. Searches are sp- – remember that all searches by law are illegal, even by the police. But there are exceptions to that. And the exceptions are search warrants for particular evidence. There's there's a lot of other things going on. I won't bore sure. you with the details. But so you have to prove to a judge that this search isn't illegal because I'm looking for uh, illegal you know, evidence or whatever the case you're looking for. And here's why I, I believe that it's at this location. So you give that to a judge. They look at the evidence. They say, okay, here, you have the right to go in limited scope. You could take this piece of paper, go there. You can enter forcibly if you need to and look for this. The problem in this case, they were looking for a lot of stuff. They were looking for a person, evidence of a person, a car. So there's a lot of, you know, the key to the car. Where can you hide a key to a car? You can hide it anywhere. But it wasn't even hidden. That was the funny part is that they were there for seven days and they don't see the key, and then on the seventh day, the key is right out there in plain sight. And, oh, by the way, yeah. the investigators uh, who were said they weren't going to be involved, who were involved in the first time putting him away, who seem to personally still think he's guilty, by the way, from the first crime that the DNA evidence proved that he wasn't guilty. That, to me, is very key here. Because you have a guilty man that's been set free. We're going to get him. I, I'm, I do lean towards i guess i do lean towards these guys setting him up um however he could be guilty there's a lot of things that would have to come into play but we're talking about they had that property for for over a week they couldn't find the key that's standing sitting right out there in broad daylight well uh, again not having been there it's difficult i just have we're to speculate. only going by by what we've seen in the in the in the tv show i've been on a lot of scenes yeah and you can't make the assumption that these houses or this property is like your house. Uh, they are right. not. They are not clean. They're not orderly. I understand. It's not, it's not easy but to find saying, stuff. But but the but the it showed the keys right the key right out in the open, and that was the prosecution's photo showed it right out in the open, and it was right where they should have seen it. And oh by the way, the guy who who was on the first case. And on this case, it shouldn't have been there on this case, was there when the evidence came up. It's just, and there are cases, let's be honest, there are cases where police have planted evidence on someone. I believe there were eight or nine, they, the New York Times did a story that had eight or nine cases in the last four or five years where police have set someone up. And they were caught by it. And, and, and you know, that police officer, that's breaking the law. That person was fired and then prosecuted. But I think it's possible... I do also agree there's a lot here that would have to fall into place in order to get them. So if you talk about the key, so, okay, let's let's say for the second that it was put there by that older investigator. I yeah. forget his name. Bank. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go out I and say. I call him Dirt Bank. Okay. Let's say he put it there. Where did he get it? So the only, you got to assume either he got it somewhere else in the apartment or the house or right. the trailer, or he got it out of the car. They already said nobody approached that car. Right. So right. now, where did he get the key? That's another good question. That's I don't the know. question you have to look at is because, when, you know, and, and I'm not talking about mm-hmm. in court. I'm saying that, you know, just common sense is if you've got the key, you got it from somewhere. So where did you get it? So now I'll ask you this question and, mm-hmm. uh, and we'll wrap. Unless anybody else has any other questions. I have one question about the car. Okay, go. The van, they were saying, what about the call that the police officer called into dispatch? asking about the mm. license plate number right. of the van just kind of out of the blue and didn't say you know they before they even uh, before, before they even found the car yeah, yeah that would not be uncommon what struck me as odd is he didn't remember why he did it right that would not be uncommon at all right uh if you if you're looking for and we have this happen all the time with like stolen cars people can't remember their plate numbers right it happens all the time you know and even because i can't necessarily remember my plate number off the top of my head either but 
even if it's you know my, you know you're nervous, your mind you can't yeah. remember. So we'll we'll check. Hey, can you check this plate? And the, yep, that's the right one. So it wouldn't be surprised if he did something like that. What I'm surprised by is that he didn't remember doing it. Right. Is that he didn't right. remember the circumstance in which because that sort of case that's that's a once in a lifetime sort of case most sure. of the time. Yeah. So you'd think that most of the details would be stuck in your head. You, okay, you know. I have a two part question for you. Part number one: um, Do you think that enough impropriety? Uh, right from the the officers that weren't supposed to be on the scene were on the scene, the uh, the, the the stuff that came out of the mouth of the of the prosecutor, um, uh, speaking to the to the members of the media, um, informing the public, trying to find a jury that is not going to know the details. Do you think there was enough um, that could have been done incorrectly that would cause Stephen Avery to have another trial? Well, I, I don't think you have. I don't think you can look at it that way. I think if it's if if the police did something that was wrong, either intentional or not, not. just the police, but the prosecution, right? right. The, but if it was brought out at trial and the jury had that information and still chose the decision, I don't think you can say that. Well, let me, that would let automatically me flip the let switch. Let me reverse it again. Then let's start with the kid. Mm-hmm. So part of the reason Avery was convicted was the testimony given by the kid, his uh, his his sixteen year old nephew. Right. The way that kid was interrogated was so improper. You would agree with that? Well, there were, it was a couple different ones, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the one that the fact that his attorney allowed the police after his the fact is surprising. Attorney, but yeah. again, that's not the police; that's on the defense attorney. So understood. You have to but make your still, argument. it was the pr- prosecution's case. Sure. So that would be enough to, to me, to uh, to. Uh, at least give that kid another another shot at a trial. And if that's the case, then Avery has to have another trial because they used testimony from the kid to convict Avery. So my question would be, do they deserve a fair trial? Did they get a fair trial based on what, at the very least on what the TV show uh, projected? Do you think they got a fair trial? I, can't, I don't think I can answer that because yeah. I think I'd have to know what was actually brought out at trial um, because, you know, when you talk about overturning convictions or right. ordering new trials, right. that's something they don't do lightly because they look and we they say, yeah. you, know, you know, jurors sat down, listened to the case, formed an opinion. What right do we have to overturn that process? Sure. I think they really have to have, you know, really sort of conclusive evidence that something really was done wrong. Not just mistakes, because mistakes you, happen in every case. Let me ask you this then. Um, if you were, you were handling this case, how would you have handled things differently? Well, you certainly, again, if you're going to recuse yourself from the investigation, then you've got to recuse yourself That's from the investigation, one. first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly would have, even if you were going to have, say, a hand in the case, I would not have had the the two people that were the targets of his uh, lawsuit. Uh, lawsuit. Who still think he's guilty from the case that right. the, DNA, the right. DNA excused him from. Right. They were the wrong people. This would be two. And then the interrogation process. I think that would you would definitely. I can't imagine you would do the interrogation the way they did it. No, because and not even not even for the purposes of the defense. Yeah, it's for the purposes of your case. Because let's right. say, for instance, you you give, want your case to stand up in court. Let's say you give him the information, and let's say you don't charge him and you let him go. Now he's taking that bit of information and running with it, and, right? And who right. knows who he's telling with it sure. to use, uh, you know, in their defense of mm-hmm. themselves. So I just don't, I don't think it's good police work in that respect. But again, I can't, I just can't, based on what I saw, I can't make the jump from that to they framed him and they actually didn't do it. Uh, uh, that, I, that's a big jump. I came out of here not wanting to have anything from Wisconsin. I don't want to consume anything <laughs> from Wisconsin. I don't ever want to go to Wisconsin. Andrew's not even a Green Bay fan anymore. Uh, right, Andrew? Is that true? It's pretty close, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, either way, pretty compelling series, would you say? It, no, it was really, it was, no. it was interesting. And again, the only thing I go to is I, I, it was leaned heavily towards one way. I agree with that, yeah. And, and you know, incompetence doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, you framed somebody. Right. I do think they right. were incompetent. I think they made a, a But incompetence could uh, require a new trial. It could. Perhaps. Again, yeah. you have to know yeah. what the jury was told. Yeah. If the jury was told of that incompetence and still made the decision, then right. yeah. they did. Do you think it was as compelling as Shades of Blue? Uh, Jennifer Shades, Lopez? Oh, Shades of Blue. Oh, geez. How, how could you, how <laughs> could you not that watch that? Night? I don't uh, know. He was just busting on it in uh, break. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the acting is just impeccable. 
all right got a break uh lieutenant steve hawk i appreciate the extra time on this thing we're all uh enthralled in this we can't help it we've all seen it all the way through i think andrew's watching it now for a second time um and each time he watches it he texts messages me about something else that he's disgusted by quick break at wibx all right, coming up on Sunday is the 13th annual United Way tailgate party on the NFL Championship Sunday. It's this Sunday. Waterfront Grill between 1 and 5 p.m. Assemblyman Mark Butler and Rocky and Barb Fiata with the Waterfront Grill have put this on every year. And it's this Sunday, 1 till 5 at the Waterfront Grill, 800 Mohawk Street, Herkimer. There'll be uh, all-you-can-eat food and prizes, and uh, Mark Butler will be there. To be the MC, details or tickets or any of that, 733-4691. It's $20, and the money goes to the United Way of the Valley and Greater Utica. So check that out this Sunday. And in studio right now is Tito, Tito Sion. Good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning, Bill. Uh, glad to have you in. And uh, Tito is a lacrosse coach. You've been selected to coach a U.S. team of uh, lacrosse players. are going to be playing in Germany, right? That's correct, yes. So, And you brought some of these guys along here. I did. Uh, we're pretty hot in, uh, in lacrosse in this region. We are. We're, we're very blessed, uh, especially in our area with all of our local schools having it. And yeah. There's good lacrosse in the area. And then, of course, Syracuse is always uh, one to look at for, for lacrosse. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, so tell us how this whole thing went down and, and who's going to be playing and who you brought with you. Um, all right, well, first I brought uh, Zach Wright. He's... One of our defensemen in Long Stick Mitty, Zach Isaac. Wells, who is a defenseman, and Jimmy Venu, who's our face-off guru and midfielder. All right. Um, this started back in November. I received an email um, that I actually thought was some sort of a scam. Yeah. And uh, I did some investigating on it and, and checked into it and found out that it was legit. Um, and you know, after making phone calls. So I told them that I would be interested in what I needed to do. And when they told me that I could pick my own team. That's big. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Um, so I started doing that um, and talking to the different schools. I've talked to uh, kids from Proctor, New Hartford, Whitesboro, um, and, of course, RFA, where I coach. And um, then Brigham Joy, who is in charge of America's team, Asked me for my coaching resume, sent it in. He called all my references, and the day he called the last reference, he called me up and he said, we'd like to offer you the position. Wow, that's a pretty huge honor. Yeah. And what a great honor for these kids to be able to play. So you're heading off to Germany, which can't be an inexpensive endeavor, by the way. No, it's not. It's it's, it's, uh, it's pricey um, per per player. It's uh, it's almost 4,900 per player. Wow. Um, But that does include their airfare, you know, there and back, Mm -hmm. uh, hotel every night that we're there, breakfast and dinner every day, transportation between the different cities that we'll be playing in, um, uniforms. So when you think about it, it's really not that much. um, Right, right. You know, but we're uh, we're trying to do as much fundraising as possible. Um, Again, I, I... I don't want the any of the players to have to pay a dime, sure, if possible. You know, and when and do you when do you, opportunity? When do you leave for this? When do you uh, head to Germany? August first. Okay. Yep. So this will be off season time, and um, and explain the tournament how it how it goes and who you'll be playing and um, um, obviously your 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 uniforms will reflect the fact that you're representing the United States. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually brought our itinerary. Um, we go to the Munich area, um, Degendorf, Heidelberg, um, and we play all club teams that are over there. Got it. Um, lacrosse isn't as big over there as it is here, mm-hmm. but good athletes are good athletes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, each you know each day we'll have a game. Uh, we play the first four quarters. Will be. U.S. lacrosse, USA lacrosse rules. Mm-hmm. And then the fifth quarter, all the kids throw their stick in a pile from both teams. Coaches grab and throw them out to the sides, and then the teams are split up. So wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for these and guys. And what a great thing if, uh, if these guys want to go off to college and play. I mean, this is a really cool. Um, so I'll uh, you guys speak up, uh, whoever would like to talk. Well, you're close. Right. So this is pretty pretty cool honor. What grade are you in and um, all of that? 
I'm in 11th grade. Okay. I play defense for Rome Free Academy. And I just think it's a great honor to be able to go over to Germany and experience a little bit of their culture yeah. and just get to play the game I love. And, and you guys uh, each interested in going on to college and maybe playing in college? Yes, uh, yes. Well, this is a pretty decent. Um, this is a pretty decent boost for that. Yeah, I, I, in my opinion, I think the colleges will like. They'll really look at you now, like something that will set you apart from yeah. a bunch of other kids. So. Coach, you agree with that? That's no oh, doubt. Absolutely, it's, yeah. it's it just raises the bar for each of the players. Jimmy right now is is deciding between two schools. He's a senior this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been very blessed at RFA with the amount of kids that we've had that have gone off to play. Yeah. Um, so it's it, and any time you play any sort of club lacrosse, um, it does like Zach was saying. It, it raises the bar and, yeah. and gets them to look at you. So. All right. Well, the big deal is I would assume is raising the money to do this whole thing. So how can we help with that? And how can people come out and 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 help you guys? Um, we we're sending out letters to different businesses. We've also set up a GoFundMe account. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, if you go to www.gofundme.com um, and go under sports and look up America's team, it's on there. Okay. Um, it's plastered all over all of our Facebook pages. Yeah. And um, and if uh, businesses or people are interested, they can um, write out a check. And, again, any amount is helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and just make the check out to ACIS. Um, How much do you have to raise totally? Um we're going to have 20 kids, so over 90,000. Okay, wow. Yeah. And and when you think about this, the best way to give is to write a check and give directly. Absolutely. Because GoFundMe is going to take a, they always take a little, there's a there's a fee involved. Right. But a check goes directly to you guys and everything goes to you. So. Right. And we're also going to uh, start putting, you know, the jugs in different stores. Mm-hmm. And, and all of the guys will be responsible for uh, at least four letters to businesses. Got it. Um, so we're 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 gonna hit it. We have a meeting tomorrow night, right, guys? Um, tomorrow night we have a meeting uh, with all the parents. Hand out all the donation letters and uh, and and get the ball rolling. All right. And practice gets started. Uh, you guys already right practicing after right um, after that. I'm talking to the Rising Stars. I talked to the Utica College Dome, which is beautiful. Yeah, I've heard good um, things about that. The the bad thing about the Utica College Dome is because their season will be starting yeah. soon. They're going to be using it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we're going to we'll be practicing as much as possible at Rising Stars. Once the white stuff goes away, yeah. Um, you know we'll be you able to use New Hartford's turf, mm-hmm. uh, our turf. Coach Pope from New Hartford will be going with us. Um, he's a offensive guru, mm-hmm. um, which these guys know that firsthand. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, what an honor, what an experience, what an amazing experience for these kids. So. Absolutely. And is. for you guys as well. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Again, uh, is there a phone number they can call if they have questions? Uh, they, on can. How they, could... they can They can call me directly. Uh, it's 315-886-8178. And uh, I'll be more than willing to answer any questions that right. they have and whatnot. All right, Tito, nice job, gentlemen. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll be Thank following. You. And when, before you go, make sure we get you back in here before you oh, take absolutely. off. So absolutely. I, I, pre- and I appreciate cool. the opportunity. And we can follow along. I'm assuming you'll have stuff on Facebook and all oh, yeah. of that, too. Yep. So. All right, great stuff. Congratulations. Whenever I do my, uh, my ministry thing, I'm going to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds me of the guy that uh, we just heard there. He does the... Uh, God said, know. man said, dot com. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. made it to Minaski. I, I listened to that commercial. Did he just say biracial marriage? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. I so, think you almost have to have a hoarse voice to do it. You know, like to be one of those. He's gonna come down from his rock, the Lord Jesus. He's gonna save you. I I don't know this for sure. I should go to the website. He's and check not it out. even gonna mess around with gay marriage. He's still stuck on biracial marriage from the '60s. Oh, right. Gosh. So you well, well you he's talking about getting the answers to those if you have that question. I don't necessarily think that he is, I, I don't know this, but I don't think that means that he is preaching against it yeah. or saying it's wrong. He's saying this issue comes up, we have the answer on our website. He's pushing He's pushing the website to go find answers to your questions. Because uh, I know at Thanksgiving, we just could not stop talking about biracial marriage. <laughs> it was, you know, and I'm like, hey, no more talking about biracial marriage. This is Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. It's almost all about marriage. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah there's a okay. lot about marriage. Well, okay. Bill is on the line. Uh, good morning, William. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Bill. I haven't. I didn't see anything in the paper about the Notre Dame uh, juggler basketball. Uh, the result uh, from yesterday, the boys. Uh, uh, I'm checking. I'm I know the big tournament that right was this weekend, but I don't know what happened. Yeah, um, nothing in today's paper about the boys. There's a girls' score. But, uh, uh, Nagel wanted to correct us here. Man said, God said is more accurate. Uh, man, man said, said God, God said. said. Oh. Okay. okay. Right. Well, there's oh. also and there's also a dating uh, thing in here too. So is marriage that, okay. and dating. If you haven't gotten married yet, All you right. can okay. get a dating thing. Yeah. It's a actually a marriage a dating service for evangelists. <laughs> and it's really quite exciting. A lot of loud uh, talking going on. All right, Bill, we'll, we'll try to find that score for you okay. and have it in the news at 830, okay? Okay. All right, well, thanks. Uh, in the studio right now is Mayor Jackie Izzo. I can say that now. Congratulations. And thank you. And, uh, you know, there was this big uh, spread on uh, what you're doing and on Rome and the potential progress in the OD over the, over the weekend. You're, uh, you, you jumped right in here. Well, that's what that was the plan. Yeah. Uh, we our transition work paid off in December because we we were able to jump right in once we got in the building. So we uh, we've done a lot in the last two weeks. Um, this is kind of foreign to me having a day off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know we're, we've got a lot more going on uh, toward the end of the month and we, just a lot of good things. Uh, we're trying to meet with as many people as we can. We cleaned up some of the uh, department meetings that we didn't get to in the transition. We've got a few more this week. So it's it's been really good. The the employees have been very welcoming, and that's been very nice for us. And what about this? Uh, I, I read something about a federal deal, a meeting you had with the feds that might mean something when it comes to economic development or something going on. Is there yes. anything you can say about that? Uh, not right at the moment, but yeah. uh, yes, it would be uh, really good for Rome. Um, it, it will kind of solidify all the things that we were talking about during the campaign. Um, it'll get us off on a track of uh, really s- studying our community and having the federal government help yeah. us facilitate that, which would be fantastic. And it will happen quickly if uh, we get this all tied up. All right. Very nice. And one of the things that you talked about during the campaign a lot is that, uh, you know, Rome has so much to offer. Uh, there's the housing issue, but then, of course, there's the base where it's already state of the art ready to go if this you know if this whole thing comes together with with uh, nanotechnology as it seems it is there could be some uh, some offshoots if you will uh, for for Rome and the base well i think the beauty of the nano at the suny campus itself just it it sits perfectly in the middle yeah and uh, i think you could go you could go either way as far as looking at locating your company we all know that once this gets up and running the chip factories online there are going to be spinoffs from that, right? And that's really uh, what you want to go after, as far as the business sector is concerned. And I think there t- there is an opportunity for us as well with housing. And you know, as we said during the campaign, and now we're starting to work on it, we need to offer more housing options, and that's one of the things that we're looking at and cleaning up what we've got on our roles yeah. now. Uh, Andrew Dominio. So. Uh, Mayor Izzo, you have in Rome a lot of access to, you know, the canal and, 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 you know, different transports and stuff like that. How will that influence seeking new business ventures as well? Well, obviously, there's been monies put into the canal development, and we've got uh, actually two more grants that we're working on down there to keep the improvements going. Uh, We also are talking with uh, Utica about maybe some joint ventures along Mm -hmm. the canal now that both communities have put so much money in, and Sylvan Beach as well. I think sure. that's an untapped opportunity in tourism. Well, when you look at uh, other areas along the canal, mm-hmm. we're way behind. Yes, I mean, we've we done stuff, we, we're moving, but we are still so far behind. We are, and if you look at the spread of where those communities are and the amenities that are offered along the way, we're positioned well in Rome for a stop, an actual overnight stop, and you continue on to Sylvan Beach. Utica as well, but we should have more synergies between us, and that's something we need to work on in the next few yeah. years. Do you feel that Rome has been left out a lot of a, a, a lot of this talk? I mean, the last year has been just a lot of things going on, a lot of cranes over Utica, if you will. Has Rome been left out, and if so, how do you fix that? I think one of the problems, and I, this has really come to the forefront in the last month or so, Rome 
was not aggressive enough in making sure it was in the conversation. And that's my job now. Yeah. That's why I've spent so much of my time in the economic development agencies, making sure I get to Utica, because there are a lot of things that happen in Utica that are good for Rome and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that um, we need, Rome is now open for business, and we need to continue to say that. And we need, our actions will speak louder than words. And so I, one of the things that I need to do is to continue to let people know that we're here, we have a lot to offer, our city uh, can still grow uh, exponentially with uh, business, and not just at Griffiths, yeah. also off into the city itself. And uh, any tough decisions that have to be made? Is there any surprises you've been, you've uh, you've uncovered as you as you entered the the office? I was. I think we were all very disappointed in the condition of the city hall building. We have some real structural issues there that we have to address. So one of the things that we've been doing when we were in Albany the other day is looking for money. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we will be successful in that. But these are there are repairs there now that have to be made, and they will have to be done within this 2016-17 cycle. Once we get that straightened away, yeah. I, the, I think government forgets that it has to present a professional image, a business-like image, uh, and that is lacking a little bit right now in Rome. So we need to clean that up as well, and yeah. we will going forward. That's probably been the biggest surprise, the work we have to do there. That building's only, I think it was opened in 1978, and it's a very different building from the last time I worked there. Uh, we a lot more office space. Yeah. Uh, just different things have happened there. But one of the great things is the employees are just fantastic throughout this, the, throughout the city. They've been more than welcoming and, and uh, helpful. And so we're looking forward to that relationship right. going forward. And then I we we really didn't talk much about this when you were on the uh, on the campaign trail, but uh, and that really was uh, I think your choice. Uh, but you are the first ever Rome, uh, first ever mayor, female uh, mayor of uh, of Rome, and maybe of, of a major city in uh, in Oneida County. There's never been a basically there's never been a Utica mayor who's been a, a female. You're the first woman. Um, is that a big deal? It seems to be. That, that well, I, I guess I've done a lot of first things in my life that involved me being a woman. Um, I never looked at it that way, even yeah. from when I was uh, a kid. I just think that you. I hope that people elected me because I was the best candidate. Right. Uh, well, yes, and that's why you really didn't talk about it. Right. Um, however, from the election to the swearing in, it was a big deal for a lot of people. Yeah. And yes, I I didn't really I downplayed it. But it was a. It is an interesting moment in history. Uh, some people were really very excited about that. A lot of people have come up to me and said, "Oh, I think it's great. We're going to have a woman, and that's male and female." Right. To me, I I've never uh, thought that way. So, but I guess uh, it, it's a moment in time. And you're right. It's uh, I'm, I'm the first one in the two major yeah. cities. And for some women, maybe that does mean an awful lot. That's a big step. Yes. When I was down at uh, the state of the state. I met a couple of other women mayors, the mayor of Hudson. Mm-hmm. She just was elected. Uh, there, there were a few of us there, not many yet, yeah. but uh, it was interesting uh, listening to the, the different struggles of being you know, a female in the office. But uh, I, I think going forward, I, I can already see where I'm more detail-oriented in the things that I look at as being important as far as image and the way we present ourselves mm-hmm. uh, is kind of foreign to some of the men. They're looking at me with two eyes going, whoa, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't think about that. Yeah. But that's always the way it's been. Um, so I guess I'll bring a different kind of flair to the to the government. Well, listen, when you're, uh, for me, when my wife uh, says to me as I'm walking out the door, you are not wearing that. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, no, you're not wearing that. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, not every guy, but some guys just can't see it. No, they can't. And they... <laughs> You they, are not wearing that. Right. Well, and it it filters down, especially, you know, we've had this, this project, let's say, in the building. There are many things that are bothering me in the City Hall building, the mm-hmm. way we are presenting ourselves. For instance, the thresholds on the doorways, the entryways, they're brass. Well, they were brass. Now they're green. So mm. I asked the guys, could you remove one of them and see what we could do with it? Well, they, they did a fantastic job with it. Yeah. It looks brand yeah. new. 
So now we're having a project to go around the building. Those are just little things yep. that make a difference when someone walks. It's like walking into your house. Right. Would right. you leave it like that in your house? Right. So those types of things we're, we're concentrating yep. on. And, and every day I tend to walk in the building. I, I can't sit still. So I'm always walking all over the place. And for the maintenance guys, it's probably not a good thing because I yep. keep seeing more things. And so I'll, I'll kind of add that to the list. Well, listen, uh, you were a basketball coach. You have mm-hmm. to pay attention to the little things because exactly. they play a role, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when you're coaching basketball, when it comes down to two really good teams, just like yesterday in the in the NFL, the little things are going to win the game, and yeah. you have to pick the little things out and do those well. Yeah. Um, speaking of little things, uh, during the State of the State, were you uh, you had to be witness to the to the to the shout out that was going on down there? Oh yes, I was uh, pretty close the, to it. The disturbance you were close to it, yeah. it was pretty pretty wild, wasn't it? I've never seen anything like that yeah. before. But the worst part of it was, and the governor said to him, "Okay, you've made your point. Everyone knows you're here. Yeah. You know, the guy would not stop. He didn't stop. He yeah, would not incredible. stop until they had to remove him, and it was embarrassing. Yeah, you know, it, yeah. especially it was an assemblyman from downstate." of the governor's party, mm-hmm. and that wouldn't have mattered either way, but, yeah. you know, there is a decorum that you need to follow and a respect for the office, and I... I there I've was been, no following that there. No. I, I've been around for a lot of years, and I've seen a lot of different things, yeah. but I've, I never witnessed anything like that on a, on a major stage. Yeah. And there was a local tie-in to the, uh, to the escort out. It was Joe Morelli, who is related to the Joe Morelli, Greens Morelli, here the assemblyman oh, from Rochester is the one okay. that escorted him out. So. Yeah, I uh, I could see them, but I, well, you know, you weren't paying attention to that yeah. so much. You were just happy they were getting him out of the room, and we could continue. And if we can talk debates, uh, talk a uh, public presentation, your public speaking, the governor, um, I thought he handled that pretty well. It got very loud. Uh, the governor mm-hmm. became, I mean, at one point he's like, you know, uh, just because you yell doesn't mean we hear you or you're right. Yet the governor, I think the governor was really yelling over him. He was. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how that played on television, but watching it unfold in front of you in the arena, it, it he did handle himself well. And he, yeah. he, he really tried not to embarrass the assemblyman. Right. Uh, he yeah. was trying hard just to say, you know, you need to sit down now. And he did yell over him. He started even he, with his speech. He just went over him. Yeah. And then finally they removed him. Pretty wild. Yeah, it was. It was very wild. Pretty wild. All right. Well, listen, uh, Mayor Izzo. We appreciate your time. Congratulations. Thank you. And the work is already underway. It is. And uh, thank you for having me back. And uh, uh, happy Martin Luther King Day to everyone out there. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much. 835 Christine does news. We're being told we're wrong on the Lindy, right? Is that yes. what you're saying, Andrew? On what? We have a listener. So the, the dance is called the Lindy. The Lindy. The song would be Blue Monday. And the Lindy sang, B. Johnson. No, the Lindy would not be the... Uh, no, uh, actually, this, this song... By the diamonds. And it is called the stroll. You would actually the dance stroll. the fish. Stroll. So be called song. the fish. The fish. The hell is the fish? I don't know, but I heard it stinks. Come, let's stroll, stroll across. This is actually a little slower than Blue Monday. What an awesome sign now this is. Turn around, baby. Let's <laughs> You ever see him stroll, Manassi? Do they stroll at your wedding? Do they do the stroll at your wedding? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Uh, on the line right now, Jeff Birnbaum. The movie is uh, 13 Hours, and uh, Christine saw it over the weekend, and Republicans are giving this one thumbs up. Jeff, good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, the, uh, accuracy? Um, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing back and forth on this, but um, it, it is a very, very compelling movie. It's uh, by director Michael Bay, who knows how to put together an action film. Yeah. Uh, he has put together some of the best of them, the Transformers series, uh, <clears throat> Armageddon, among others. Uh, I think the latest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie, by the way. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, yeah. uh, it's, it is, <laughs> we'll leave that one out. It's, a, it's, it's a, a um, fast-paced uh, personal tale, really, about the um, CIA contractors who... Um, uh, tried at least to prevent the deaths of four Americans, including the ambassador, uh, back in uh, 
when Benghazi yeah, was yeah. under assault, and Hillary Clinton was still the Secretary of State. And so even though there's not a Hillary Clinton character in there, um, uh, the, a lot of people who have go, gone to see it have said that they feel kind of uncomfortable that any Americans were allowed to stay in such an unstable, insecure facility, yeah. uh, and the mere fact that uh, there was some delay somehow, um, that the higher-ups uh, had to have been implicated. This is not an attack on Hillary Clinton, but it also cannot be good news for her politically, coming out right now, right before the Iowa caucuses, and reminding people of this terrible incident under her watch. You know, I, I would say that this is a dig-in movie. Yes, uh, those that are 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 negative on uh, Hillary Clinton uh, would dig in even even deeper, not that they need to, probably. And those that support her dig in on the other side, oh, this is all part of the conspiracy. I'm shocked we've not heard that out of the mouth of Hillary again, this conspiracy against her. But, you know, as she's going into uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, very close with Bernie Sanders, and in, I think New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders in the lead, I'm surprised Bernie Sanders isn't hammering her on, on Benghazi. Uh, well, he, he had the chance last night, yeah. I guess, uh, during the last pre-Iowa Democratic debate, and he didn't. Um, uh, so I guess this is more exciting for Republicans, right, or right. I guess independents. Um, clearly, uh, Republicans are happy. There are, are uh, There's a super PAC on the Republican side that had a screening in Washington, D.C. Of, uh, of 13 hours, and the conservative magazine the weekly standard is crowing about it so certainly republicans are happy to see it here whether it has an effect on the democratic uh primary or caucus season i guess remains to be seen but as i say it, it can't be helpful uh to persuade uh let's say democrats who are on the fence right, it doesn't right. give them another reason to vote for hillary clinton yeah and it's not as if democrats have all that much of a of a choice this year well, uh, you know. um, I guess that's right. And uh, what's surprising about Iowa and New Hampshire is that uh, a lot of Democrats are choosing Bernie Sanders, at least according to the polls, yeah. more than you could imagine uh, would be possible. And more than seems likely, given that Hillary Clinton is very far ahead in national polls of right, Bernie right. Sanders. Interesting stuff. Jeff Birnbaum, have you seen the movie yet? I have just seen parts of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. going to see the whole thing today. So. All right. All right. Enjoy your day. We appreciate your time this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, your thoughts on the on the movie, Christine? You saw it over the weekend. Yep. I actually, I think that um, I agree with, with Willie. Willie gave it a two and a half yeah. waffles. And I agree with his assessment that the writing wasn't what it should be. But, you know, for me, when I go to the movies, I love going to the movies because I take off my journalism hat. I take off almost every hat. This movie, I couldn't take off my veteran hat. And so that's where it struck a, the deepest chord with me. I am also not a fan of of the actor John Krasinski necessarily yeah. was a huge fan after this movie. I thought he did an amazing job and it's really one of those like Rambo esque pro America pro hero mm -hmm. stories. So if you don't want that, you know, well, I got to tell you, Glenn Beck was like going off on the thing on Thursday. I mean, screaming going off that this Good is or bad. Um, saying that it, it, that every American should be required to see it. Mm -hmm. um, but that I, how our military allowed, no matter what Washington said, how our military allowed this to happen was his gripe. Your right. thoughts on that? On I, that? Absolutely. I, yeah. I couldn't agree. Um, I could not agree more with that statement. I mean, obviously, if you if you know nothing about Benghazi and don't care about politics at all, that's what will strike a chord with the person who you know watches yeah, this yeah. movie. I you know I'm a big thing for staying for the credits. I did notice that at the credits, the consultant, there was one consultant on the movie. And I don't know if that's because of the fact that most of the people who could have given a first account are dead. Yeah. Um, well, that's part of what Willie had talked about is that in terms, he said it's a movie. Um, I, when it comes to accuracy. Right, it's a movie. It's not yeah, a documentary. it's really kind of one-sided and... Um, and but I think it accurately portrayed the feelings of not no only doubt about those it. soldiers who yeah. were involved, but soldiers and this who go over there. this is a new thing, right? It's not new. No. When you think of military, um, you, you see stories that go back from, from any of our wars, World War One, World War II, uh, Vietnam, the a Korean conflict, where our men and women today are placed in a position where they're supposed to have backup and something happens and they don't get backup. 
Um, it's an awful thing when that happens. They're they're on their own. But also, you know, it serves as like a microcosm of what happens in the Middle East and the situation there right now yeah. that you don't know the good guys from the bad guys. Right. You don't know who your friends are. You don't know who your allies are. And somebody could be your friend today and then someone hands them a bigger bag of money mm-hmm. tomorrow yeah. and they turn against you. Yeah. And uh, the ambassador was somebody who was loved by those people. He was loved and he, it, you know, at least as it was portrayed in this movie, really had good intentions. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not sure that anybody has contested that. Right. right. His belief is that he was going to be able to make change and make things make change for the better. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting stuff. Movies out there. You might want to get out and see it. There there are a few theaters not showing still Star Wars. Right. Uh, 852. We'll come back and wrap this up for the day. Hold tight. It's Martin Luther King Day. WIBX.